The conclusion of the book of Ruth is found in the epilogue, namely chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, uh, which talk about the fact that Boaz and Ruth do in fact get married. They do have a son named Obed, and that Naomi's family is restored. And then uh, verses 18 through 22 form what you might call a coda, uh, a musical term, uh, to the book, uh, basically giving ten generations from Perez uh, to King David uh, of uh, the uh, uh, of David's uh, genealogy. But as we're going to see, uh, the import of that extends far beyond David. So first, verses thirteen through seventeen. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. David. Now, this final section eliminates, uh, or culminates, rather, the uh, resolution of the central problem, which was raised back in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, namely the deaths of Elimelech, um, Malon, and Kilion and which led to the great emptiness, bitterness of Naomi. This section also parallels and contrasts with Naomi and Ruth's entrance into Bethlehem and their interaction with the women in chapter 1, verses 19b through 22. The author again demonstrates his mastery of literary form, this time not by employing chiasm, but parallelism. Uh, the scene is bracketed by statements concerning the birth of a son. Verse 13b, a son has been born. And then in verse 17a, uh, uh, that a son has been born. Um, and uh, in verse 13b, she bore a son. And then uh, verse 17a, a son has been born. Uh, the scene uh, also is, shows parallelism. Verses 13 through 15 begins with a narrative statement and then speech of the women. Verses 16 is another narrative statement. Verse 17, speech of the women. Now, in verse 13, the Lord makes his only his second appearance in the book, where it says, and the Lord gave her conception. The first appearance uh, was in chapter 1, verse 6. The Lord visited his people and gave them food. Now, um, one could therefore say, that these two references to God's actions, these are the only two references to God by the narrator of the book, not the characters in the book, in their dialogue, you could say that those two references to God in effect frame the entire book uh, or frame the entire story. Uh, but we've seen God at work behind the scenes all throughout uh, this. God has continued to be present and as we look at it, even both of his, quote, appearances in chapter 1, verse 6, and here in chapter 4, verse 13, um, are not uh, overt, uh, they're not miraculous, supernatural, but they are him acting through natural means. Um, now, the book here is contrasting Ruth's 10 years of childless marriage uh, in, to Malin in Moab with the apparent rapid conception she experienced after marrying Boaz. Now, Robert Hubbard points out that there's more to the story uh, than God simply giving conception to Ruth. Hubbard says, granted, Yahweh's help enabled Ruth to conceive, but there would have been no birth at all without human actions, sexual consummation by the newlyweds, uh, Boaz's day in court, the meetings of Ruth and Boaz, her migration uh, to Judah from Moab, um, and as we have seen, these things were ultimately orchestrated by God, even though there is no overt miracle. The voice of God is never heard, 
no divinely authorized authority figure like a prophet or a priest or a judge appears. Um, and what Ruth is telling us is that God does not guide human affairs through intermittent miracles followed by long periods of apparent absence. Instead, his activity is hidden behind the actions of human agents. He is presumed to be the implicit cause of events. And as we've seen, even the smallest accidental details of life are, in the biblical conception, attributable, ultimately, to God. Um, in other words, God is hidden, but he is continuously caused the ultimate cause of everything. As uh, another writer points out in Ruth, God remains on the scene every moment, but hidden. Here he acts in the needs and hopes of ordinary people. Um, now, the, the birth of Obed uh, fulfills Boaz's prayer, you know, that the Lord would richly bless Ruth. Um, and the blessing of the people and the elders uh, this shows the reversal of Naomi's bitterness and emptiness. Um, and all of this, as we see, uh, ultimately leads to David. That is telling us. This story of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz shows us that the daily events of our individual and family lives, even though they just seem normal and not out of the ordinary, they may have a significance including a long-term and deep theological significance far beyond anything we can perceive or could possibly imagine. I mean, you know, if you think, I live in the middle of nowhere, I live a humdrum life, I am just an ordinary person, and so on. Well, C.S. Lewis said many years ago, there are no ordinary people. The people that you meet with each day, uh, that you marry, that you get angry with, that you snub, that you work with, and so on, if you could see what they are going to be, they are going to be so magnificent that if you could see them like that now, you would be sorely tempted to fall on your face in worship. Or they will turn out to be creatures of such horror as the kind that you only meet, if at all, in a nightmare. There are no such things as ordinary people. Everything we are doing has a significance far beyond the moment, far beyond this life even. It ultimately all has eternal, everlasting significance. And think about that, because if we truly understand that, it should affect how we treat people, what we do with our money, what we do with our time, how we spend our lives. Now, it's important, though, that Christians do not draw a false conclusion from the birth of Obed. Some people think like this. If we live lives of hesed and faithfulness, then God will be faithful to answer our prayers and give us children, or help me financially, or whatever else we are praying for. That conclusion is completely unwarranted. Okay? Now, what is being described here uh, in verses 13 through 17 is description, not prescription. In other words, it is describing what happened to one particular couple uh, at one point in time. It is not saying, if you live this way, then God is going to pour out money on you and give you children, and you're not going to have any problems. Not at all. Of course, we are to live lives of hesed and faithfulness, and God will honor that. But God has not promised to every loving and faithful Christian couple or individual children, wealth, health, or any other particular blessing. I mean, God is sovereign over the world. And he's sovereign over, as we've seen, everyone and everything that happens. Everything is a part of his plan. He raises some up, he puts others down. He makes some rich and makes some poor. He kills, he makes alive, uh, and so on. Now, although there is a general connection between how we live and how prosperous we can be, 
we cannot presume upon the Lord for earthly blessings because both the Old Testament and the New Testament indicate that God's protecting the poor and vindicating the afflicted do not occur immediately or even necessarily in this lifetime. Millions of Christians, including countless numbers today, have lived in poverty, have suffered, been persecuted, and died for their faith through the ages. And that is exactly what Christ and the apostles promised us, okay? Um, we talk a lot about I mean, this, this whole prosperity gospel way of thinking is heresy. We talk a lot about that uh, in our book on biblical stewardship, okay? Particularly uh, the section on a critique of the prosperity gospel. I mean, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Um, and, uh, you know, think about Job. He suffered terrible losses, not because he didn't have faith or was in sin, but precisely because he was righteous. Look at Jesus. Look at the apostles. They were all uh, tormented, persecuted, and killed not because of sin or lack of faith, but precisely because they were faithful. Um, now, Gordon Fee reminds us, even though God has promised to vindicate his own, and by the way, our vindication and joy will last forever. Uh, just take a look at Revelation 21, verse 4. He has seldom promised immediate vindication. For example, Hebrews 11, verses 32 through 39. Some by faith, saw great victories, but others, it says, by faith were destitute. By faith they were destitute. But they all are commended for their faith. And these words were spoken to encourage believers who themselves had joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property, according to Hebrews 10, verse 34. Um, so, immediate vindication is not promised to them. Now, so, again, we need to have a proper biblical view of things, okay? And that's why we said at the beginning of this book, we naturally, just like Naomi, when things go bad, some people think, ah, it must be because of sin. You're being paid back for your sin. No, Job wasn't. The, the man born blind in John 9 wasn't, and so on. But we all naturally tend to either think that or we shake our fist at God. We might have a high view of his sovereignty, as Naomi did, but we don't have a broad enough view because we simply cannot see. He knows the end from the beginning, and we can trust him. Why? Look at Jesus. Look what he did on the cross. He bore the punishment you deserve, namely hell. He experienced millions of eternities in hell for you, for, uh, for all those whom he has redeemed. So that shows he was faithful to God all the way to the end. Anyone who will do that for me, I can trust all the way to the end, even though I do not understand or particularly like some of the things that are happening in my life. Yet we can trust him because he loves us and he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Um, now, this last section of the book brings us back full circle, uh, uh, focusing on Naomi and the child. The story begins with Naomi's losses. It ends with her gain. It began with death. It ends with birth. Um, and as a result, therefore, the women do not see the significance of the child in the fact that uh, he's the heir of Elimelech. In Instead, they say, a child has been born to Naomi, okay? Um, and so uh, it, it's showing she came back empty, so she said, now she is full. There are a number of other ironies in this. The name Obed means serving. Uh, and uh, although the Redeemer in verse uh, 14 uh, could be taken as Boaz, uh, when it says, uh, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. The he, at the beginning of verse 15, indicates that the women are referring to Obed. Now, he's a newborn, but 
He's a redeemer in at least two ways. First, through his birth, he has restored life and wholeness to Naomi and to the family. And secondly, he will be uh, a nourisher of her old age. Um, and again, another irony. Although Obed's name means redeemer, in verse 16, we see Naomi taking uh, Obed and nourishing him as his nurse. And by the way, uh, the word for nurse there uh, uh, is uh, basically means uh, a guardian, not a wet nurse. Um, and so she's nourishing him. Um, the, in verse 17, it uses the language of a joyful birth announcement, but applies it to Naomi. It says that uh, the women gave uh, him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. Now, normally, birth announcements were given to uh, the father who would not have been present uh, for the birth. But here again, it's, it's like the form of a birth announcement being given to uh, Naomi. Uh, and the women are said to have named Obed, although culturally it was usually the men who gave the children their names. Now, uh, one writer, Frederick Bush, says that this is an example when it says, and the women gave him a name, and they named him Obed. It's an example of poetic license in that the women did not formally name the child, but they named him, <coughs> pardon me, by providing the explanation for his name with their glad cry, a son has been born to Naomi. So we see that God has been continually at work in this book. We've seen it in multiple ways, but this is confirmed in the fact that every prayer in the book has been answered. Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Naomi's prayer that the Lord bless her daughters-in-law and that they find rest with a, in the house of a husband. Chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz's prayer that the Lord uh, fully reward Ruth. Chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, Naomi's prayer that Boaz be blessed. Chapter 3, verse 10, Boaz's prayer that Ruth be blessed. Chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, the people's prayer that Boaz and Ruth be blessed with offspring. And chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, the women's prayer that the Lord be blessed and that Naomi be restored to life and sustained. Now, since only God answers prayer, these answers indicate his continual presence and activity throughout the story. Um, and, but again, note, the means by which God answered these prayers were through the decisions and actions of people. Now, in verse 15, praise is given to Ruth uh, at the end of verse 15, and it says uh, to, about Ruth, who loves you, Naomi, and is more to you than seven sons. That's also significant and ironic. In a male-dominated society, seven sons were the ideal number. See 1 Samuel 2, verse 5, and Job 1, verse 2, and Job 42, verse 13. Yet Ruth, a female, and a Moabitess, is worth more than seven sons. Daniel Block adds, More than anyone in history of Israel, Ruth embodies the fundamental principle of the nation's ethic. You shall love your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Moses instructs Israel to love the stranger, as they love themselves. But ironically, it is this stranger from Moab who shows the Israelites what this means. Again, irony abounds throughout this book. Um, the last sentence of verse 17, how Obed was the father of Jesse, the father of David, both harkens back to the beginning of the book and links to the concluding genealogy in verses 18 through 22. Ruth 1 verse 2 had subtly hinted at this conclusion by stating that Elimelech and his family were Ephrathites from Benjamin in Judah. That's exactly how David is described in the account of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, verse 12, where it says, Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. Um, in short, the story of Ruth is crucial to the subsequent history of Israel, because without Ruth, the line of Elimelech would have been extinguished, as would the line of Boaz. And as a result, no David. Uh, and so, and it's interesting to think that all this happened when there was no king in Israel. But that leads to the coda, the genealogy 
of David in verses 18 through 22, which say, Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now, in the ancient Near East and in the Bible, genealogies are often telescoped. In other words, certain names are omitted for didactic or instructional purposes. Uh, there was a tendency in the ancient Near East to limit genealogies to five or ten generations. We have ten here. But genealogies serve to function to legitimate claims of position and authority or power uh, in various political or social contexts. Um, one writer uh, has concluded, therefore, that uh, this book was included in the canon of Scripture uh, uh, and these genealogies uh, included here uh, to legitimate David because he had uh, a Moabite uh, grandmother. Uh, be that as it may, the book, the genealogy, ends with David um, because he was the ideal ruler of uh, Israel. But we need to understand, this genealogy points beyond David. Why? David is not an end in and of himself. And that is because 2 Samuel chapter 7 contains the Davidic covenant by which God promised to raise up David's seed after him and establish his kingdom forever. Uh, that is also talked about uh, in Psalm 89. Um, now, a number of other prophecies point to this in Jeremiah 33, Ezekiel 37, Zechariah 12. Therefore, David naturally and biblically points beyond himself to the greater son of David, namely the Messiah, who is none other than Jesus Christ. John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, recognized this when he prophesied concerning the coming birth of Jesus. He said in Luke 1, verses 68 and 69, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Now, Zechariah's prophecy uh, says that the coming of the Messiah uh, and the... Uh, Blessings he brings uh, are based upon God's mercy, which in Greek is the word Elias, and in Hebrew is the word chesed. Um, now, the Jews recognized that the phrase son of David means the Messiah. Matthew indicates this in his genealogy in Matthew 1 by describing Jesus as the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus asked the Pharisees in Matthew 22, what they thought about the Christ. They, he said, whose son is he? And they said, he's the son of David. Um, and others recognized Jesus's uniqueness and power by describing him as the son of David. And Jesus applied the term to himself. And you may recall when he healed the blind man from Jericho who had called him son of David by healing him, Jesus was publicly acknowledging his role as the Messiah. Now, Jesus' resurrection shows that he is indeed the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Paul's major speech in Acts 13 concerned how Christ is the promised Savior, a descendant of David, and his central point is that God fulfilled his promise to David and to Israel by raising Jesus from the dead. Um, and his Paul's words in Acts 13 parallel the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Christ, the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead, Paul points out, no more to return to corruption. And because of that, Paul then uh, quotes or paraphrases Isaiah 55 verse 3, uh, which says, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, which refers to the Davidic covenant. Um, and so, in other words, he is showing that Jesus fulfills the Davidic covenant. The covenant. Before he was born, the angel Gabriel promised Mary that the Lord God would give Jesus the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. Jesus said, 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And on the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter relates by quotation and allusion. 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 16, 110, and 132, to the effect that being seated on David's throne is linked to being seated at God's right hand. In other words, when Jesus rose from the grave and ascended back to the Father and sat down next to the Father, what Peter was arguing that the true fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the true seed of David, has sat down on the throne of David, which is not a chair that's going to be built in literal Jerusalem. No, he is on the throne of David now. It is in heaven. He is reigning now as the fulfillment uh, of the uh, Davidic covenant, where he has all power. So, the story of Ruth, to conclude, reminds us, it, it resolves a desperate family tragedy, but it is also an integral link in the history of the nation of Israel. But it points beyond that to the most pivotal person in all of history, namely Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of the world. While Obed is called a redeemer in verse 14, Jesus is the ultimate redeemer. Take a look at Luke 1, verse 68, Galatians 3, verse 13, Titus 2, verse 14. In his discussion of biblical law, David Dalby points out that the idea of God or Jesus as redeeming mankind from sin and damnation, apparently a purely religious idea, derives from these ancient rules about the institution of the Goel. Robert Hubbard adds that the whole institution of the Goel threw Israel a profound uh, challenge to give up greed, give up excessive pride, give up apathy, and presented Israel with a more excellent way to live and called for a kinder and gentler Israel. Um, and thus, from a New Testament perspective, the institution of the Goel pointed forward to the great Redeemer who paid for redemption with his own blood. So Lawson Younger concludes, it's not difficult to see how the New Testament could interpret Christ's death in terms of the Goel. Jesus functions as the ultimate Goel, and it's highlighted by the fact that he says, I'm not ashamed to call you brothers, because remember, in Israel, the institution of Goel was based primarily on clan and family relationships, although, as we have seen in the book of Ruth, uh, when Ruth invokes Chesed uh, on, uh, for Orpah, and, uh, uh, or when Naomi invokes that and prays that the Lord will bless them, they're not even members of the uh, Jewish community. So even in the beginning of the book, it's showing that the principles here are not just limited to Israel, but they apply cosmically. And that finds its fulfillment at the end of the book when the genealogy of David points basically to the greater son of David, namely Jesus the Messiah. In sum, the great Goel uh, is Yahweh himself. But human beings like Boaz, Ruth, and Christians today who practice chesed and goel type of redeeming activity are the agents of God's divine activity and are following in the ministry of the ultimate human goel, namely Jesus Christ. You see, without realizing it, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz were participants in a drama of eternal significance. The same can be said about us. We may not see it, we may not feel it, but our lives, your life, is far more important than you realize. And this story about a little family tragedy and how it got resolved shows us that that is what it is ultimately all about. It's ultimately our lives have eternal significance. So be a practicer of chesed, uh, of loving kindness, be a goel for those in need, and God will honor and bless that. God bless you.